All righty. Okay, so welcome to everybody. Um, this is our Zoom, Zoom event. Um, and uh, we're very, very excited to uh, welcome Amy Zeidelman from her home in, in the Philadelphia area. Um, but before we actually, um, I introduce you to Amy, um, I'm just gonna say a little bit, cause I see that there are women here who are not uh, people I don't know. And I just want to mention a little bit that this is a Core Connects Rhode Island event. Core Connects Rhode Island was originally started to con connect Jewish women in the state of Rhode Island and sort of Southern Massachusetts or ever wants to participate in our, in our gatherings. And then obviously when Zoom came along, we were unable to gather in person. Everything's been on Zoom since um, March and the, 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 the sky's the limit. Everybody's invited wherever you live. And as I, can, as I look around the room here, I see women from North Carolina, from um, Rockville, from um, obviously Philadelphia, um, um, all over. <laughs> and uh, everybody's invited. So we have a lot of programs and I'm not gonna run through them, but you are welcome to join all of them. It's on our website, please take a look. Um, the next really big one is our virtual Halabek, which we'll be doing on February the 11th, and you're invited to that, as are you invited to everything that we run. So please feel free to join us and um, connect with us, and we can create Jewish unity. Um, and so that's a perfect segue to introducing Amy. Um, when I looked at her website and I read her mission statement, it's a lot about connection. It's a lot about using food to bring people together, to um, create community through food. And um, I know that Amy's gonna be talking a little bit about Zoom, the company that she co-founded with her sisters, two sisters. And so it's obviously a family run business that um, imports that's tahini and date syrup from Israel. And so I, we, we know I'm gonna ask you a few questions about that. Hopefully you'll elucidate us a little bit to exactly what you do and how you do it and how it works and running a family business and women owned and blah, blah, blah. Very exciting. And what tahini is exactly um, and how healthy it is, all of that. Um, but Amy is um, a trailblazer. She was actually named, um, let's see if I can read this, uh, to Forbes 30 under 30 class of 2018 list for the food and drink category. She's author of the tahini table go beyond hummus with a hundred recipes for every meal and in between um, she lived in israel for a year and she's been talking to Hini ever since since 2013. Um, she's married she has a little boy who we saw um, henry and a dog we didn't see the dog um, and she enjoys yoga and bo bowling and spending time outside with her family and promoting community and connection through food and uh, so now I'm going to turn us over to Amy. I don't know if you have anything to say before I ask you any questions, but um, I'm going to hand, hand the mic over to you. Oh, I just want to say thank you so much for inviting me to join your community and extended community. It is a, a warm welcome for me um, to break up the monotony of uh, still being at home. Although I do go into the office and warehouse still to run our operations, but I'm just so excited to connect with you, connect with this community, and I look forward to your questions and then sharing uh, these recipes. So the questions, ladies, I'm gonna ask you to put questions in the chat, and then I'll ask Amy the questions. I think that will be a little less um, chaotic <laughs> than people <laughs> unmuting themselves since we have, um, I'm still letting people in. We'll have close to 50 people in the, in the, in the session. So. Um, please feel free to write questions in the chat and hopefully I'll be able to ask them all, but uh, please don't be upset if I don't. And um, so that's how we'll do it. So please mute yourself if I haven't already muted you. And um, Amy, tell us a little bit about Zoom and how that came to be. Sure, so Zoom Foods is the business that I started uh, with my two older sisters, Shelby and Jackie. Back in 2011, I was a senior in college uh, my oldest sister, Shelby, was spending her year in Israel, just kind of like between jobs after college. And our middle sister, Jackie, actually moved to Israel in 2008. Um, she at first was on a gap year program after high school and decided to stay to complete her studies in Israel, ended up marrying or meeting an Israeli man, now is married with two beautiful uh, Israeli children. They live in the north in Shevet Zion, but Back in 2011, Jackie and Omri were dating, and Omri was in the tahini, or of course in Israel they call it 
cleanup business um, in Israel. He was a broker of sorts between manufacturers and homosiot and um, and other like salad makers, caterers, restaurants, and was distributing tahini. So when Shelby and I would connect with Jackie, she would sometimes be you know texting us pictures from these obscure warehouses with these big heavy pails of God knows what. And we're always saying, you know, what are you doing? And she says, oh, my boyfriend, Neil Marie, he has a tahini business and I love to help him with it. So fast forward, when Shelby got the chance to meet Omri for the first time and Omri had her taste tahini, uh, she was really blown away. And that's because the tahini in Israel at the time, still today, until, you know, Zoom and other businesses like Zoom have started bringing it over, was much better than the tahini available in the States. Uh, the tahini in Israel for the past decade or almost 15 years has been pressed from a, a special sesame seed from Ethiopia. It's called white humera sesame, and it grows in the Northwest region of Ethiopia. This sesame seed is coveted for pressing into tahini specifically because it has a really nice nutty flavor profile and a really great consistency of oil to the rest of what we call the sesame meat. And so it's just super friendly seed for pressing into tahini. And so my older sister Shelby studied business. Uh, she called me while I was in college and she had me do some market research. And what I did was I went to every grocery store that I could find, asked where the tahini was. Of course, most clerks didn't know where it was or what tahini was. Uh, it, I found it you know, on the bottom shelf of the international aisle with dust on the lids. And we realized that there was an opportunity to not only bring good tahini to the States, but also to educate the American market about tahini, what it is, how you use it, and the health benefits. And so we spent over a year and a half doing additional market research. We went on a family trip, um, the two of us with my sister's then boyfriends, now husbands, uh, to Ethiopia for the first time. And we brought over our first import of quality tahini um, in May of 2013. So we've been uh, selling tahini, preaching tahini, you know, living, breathing tahini for almost eight years now, actually more, probably like 10. So that's the that's the story of Zoom. Perfect. So question, um, do you add anything to your tahini? Like how, how do you make it? <laughs> no, so the tahini is simply sesame seed roasted and then pressed through a, uh, a very great manufacturing uh, facility and machinery straight into just fresh tahini. So there are some like, tahini- I don't really need to make tahini. Come again? Um, everybody, could you please put your questions in the chat. That way, it'll be um, it'll it'll work better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, some tahini available on the market back in 2011 and still to today might have added oils or maybe even a little bit of salt. But no, for Zoom, the 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 special sauce is just 100% roasted and pressed sesame seeds. Quick question: Somebody asked, um, does it need to have a kosher um, supervision for it to be? Um, accessible to everybody? So Zoom does have a kosher um, certification. Like a lot of things coming out of Israel, it's sealed under the OK Hashgacha. Um, but tahini, I mean, it's, it's, it's based on people's kosher preferences, right? Because it is only sesame seeds. And most tahini is produced in facilities that only produce tahini. Uh, but yes, all Zoom products do have a kosher Hashgacha on them. So we want you to know a few people have said this, that Michael Solomonov, is that how you say it? You got um, it. He was in Providence. Um, he did, he did, uh, he did, a, he was like a guest speaker at the Jewish Alliance and oh. he raved about your tahini. And so some of the ladies here bought it because he recommended it. So that was actually a really important part of Sum's story um, and of actually a, a, a key part of even our market research. Before we got our first import, Shelby had been living in Philly for a couple of years and, um, and had known Mike, you know, Chef Salamanov through the Jewish community. Michael Salamanov, as much as you might have thought, is 100% just the greatest mensch. And so we simply asked him if we could have a meeting. And all we asked in that meeting is what I ask of most people. Well, most people I say, are you familiar with tahini? And if they are, most aren't. You know, then I go into, well, what tahini are you using? Where are the seeds from? But for Chef Mike, I we simply asked, you know, what tahini are you using? And back in 2011, he said, or 2012 at this point, he said, um, you know, I don't know. It's whatever my distributor brings me and it's not very good. 
So we told him, well, we have an idea. We want to bring high quality tahini from Israel and market it and sell it to the American market, you know, not only to, to people at home, but also restaurants. And he said, great, when you get it in, bring it over. He said he'd buy it, but we we're like, well, why don't you try it first? So um, immediately after we got our first import, I made a meeting with Mike and his team, Steve Cook and Yehuda Sechel, who was then his uh, executive chef. And they tasted the tahini and they swapped it on the spot. And so Mike has been an amazing ambassador, a great partner and friend to us. In as much as back in 2015, when he released the Zahav cookbook, he mentioned Zoom in the cookbook as well. And it was really valuable for building credibility for our brand and also for and also for, you know, um, helping educate American consumers about all the ways that you can use tahini. Amazing. Amazing. Good for you. <laughs> so I want to know, please feel free to put questions in the chat, ladies. Um, I want to know why we used to buy it in, um, and it would be like rock solid on the bottom. Like, how do you stop that from happening? So mostly that's due to time. So Zoom really tries, even though we have a long lead time, right, because we're pressing our sesame seeds in Israel and bringing it to the States, we still try to press it as often as possible. Tahini, you can press and it's good for over two years from production. And so the longer it sits, mm -hmm. the harder it gets at the bottom. You'll see that as an old Zoom jar does that as well. But um, even if you're getting a, a more fresh Zoom jar, like a natural peanut butter or almond butter, that oil will separate, but it's easier to rehomogenize. But mostly it's because of A, the type of seed that was used. It wasn't that good ratio of oil to the rest of the sesame substance. But B, it's likely because back in, you know, whenever you bought those cans of tahini, uh, it just sat on the shelf for a really long time. So the longer the product sits, uh, the worst it is. But if you do find product that has a hard, you know, um, maybe consistency at the bottom, you can simply just take your fork and start re immersifying, re, you know, re blending it with the rest of the tahini. Or if you're using it in a recipe, you might just find that you end up using a little bit more liquid, a little bit more water than what the tahini rest, you know, sauce might call for originally. So you can definitely use old, harder tahini, but you want to try to find tahini that's as fresh as possible. Right. Um, so our, some of our ladies, a lot of these ladies live in our area, Providence, Southern, uh, Southern Massachusetts. Um, they want to know where to buy it. Can we buy it other than online? Is it best to just buy it and order it from you online? So we're not in a lot of stores in Rhode Island. We are in a few stores in the Boston area. Like we work, um, you know, if, if Chef Mike Salamanov is notable, also Anna Sortoon at Oleana and her partner, Maura Kilpatrick from Sofer Bakery. They have a small retail market. Um, you know, retail stores like Formaggio Kitchen uh, sell Zoom and like small specialty stores like that. But we're making a real conservative effort this year to try to get into more stores, especially throughout the Northeast um, to expand our corridor from where we're typically distributed which is between DC and New York at this point. So well, anything we can do to help here. you, we're, we're here for you. <laughs> I'll hit everybody up for suggestions or introductions if anybody has, uh, I'd very much appreciate that. All right, so do you want to start talking about- yes. why don't I jump house? in and start making the cookies? That yes. way I'll get um, half my batter in, in cookie shape. I usually just reserve half the batter to make at a separate time because I can't keep too many cookies in my house. I eat so many of them. Um, and then from there, once they're in there, I can open it up to more questions and we can also put together the uh, maple tahini granola. So for the tahini sugar cookies, I love these cookies because they really are a crossover between a tahini shortbread cookie, which is a very common tahini recipe to find either in cookbooks or online um, and a peanut butter cookie. Um, tahini just has a really nice, sophisticated, nutty, but kind of like deeper flavor than peanut butter. And so these cookies are just a really simple, almost biscuit. That's great to have uh, for, of course, snacking in the evening or, uh, you know, with, for an afternoon pick-me-up with some coffee. So this is actually a very simple recipe. What we're going to do is combine butter. This is three quarters of a stick or six tablespoons of unsalted butter. It's at room temperature. You'll see that I'm not going to be using any type of equipment besides, you know, wooden bowls and spatulas. 
I really prefer that because I don't keep a lot of equipment in my house. But of course, if you have a stand mixer or something like that, you can always incorporate it that way. We're also gonna be doing half a cup of tahini. So my jar um, is actually not one of our freshest jars that we have in distribution right now. But um, simply what you wanna do when you open a new jar of tahini is when you open up the jar, you'll see that there is a film on top. Um, I actually already removed mine. What I do is I remove that and then I very gently close the lid completely, but not tight, tight, tight. And then I shake the tahini well. You'll feel that even if a little bit of oil is separated, that the tahini re-blends really easily and you'll get like big globs of tahini shaking back and forth in your jar. So that's one of the benefits of using a, a well immersive, a well blended, a fresh um, and also high quality seed tahini like soon, as opposed to maybe some of the more conventional tahini that you'd find uh, on the bottom shelf of your international aisle. So we're gonna do half a cup of tahini. Another tool that I love keeping around is a you know really um, soft uh, silicone spatula. That's because tahini sticks to literally any surface. Uh, just a heads up, if you're cooking with tahini or baking with tahini and you spill some, just expect to have a lot of cleaning to do. It's the story of my life. I've cleaned up many of spills of tahini, uh, but it is a very helpful tool for getting tahini out of the nooks and crannies of maybe uh, something that you're using. So it's half a cup of tahini, the six tablespoons of butter, and then we're doing half a cup of both regular granulated sugar and also half a cup of packed light brown sugar. It might sound like a lot, but these cookies actually yield, this recipe yields a ton of cookies. Uh, these are not overly sweet, and so I really love them. And then we're also going to do a quarter teaspoon of um, ground fine sea salt. I like to just keep that in a little bowl in my kitchen because I'm typically like picking up pinches of it here and there, but this recipe calls for a quarter teaspoon. And we're just gonna blend that together with, um, a wooden spoon. So this is usually a good time as I incorporate it. If any other questions popped up for me to take some more questions. I want to know if you made this recipe up yourself. What do you mean by what do you, what do you like? Mean? Did you, did you, did you discover this? Did you get it from somewhere? Like what's the source of this particular combination of ingredients? So I worked with an amazing cookbook author named Andy Schloss, Andrew Schloss who has written 23 cookbooks. He's a highly acclaimed um, author and uh, recipe developer. And he's really who helped me articulate some of the way, some of the things that I love using tahini for into true recipes. Because I, um, my mother is not like super big on recipes. Um, and I, you know, when I cook with tahini or bake with tahini, I'm like, oh, pour a little of this, pour a little of that. And I never really measured. And so when I explained to him how I love using tahini as a substitute for peanut butter, he said, oh, well, I have the perfect, I mean, truly tested peanut butter recipe. Let's mm -hmm. sub in tahini, let's test it, sub in the tahini until we get the right consistency for these very plain kind of like peanut butter biscuit um, cookies. So Andrew was actually a huge partner with me in creating this. Um, we have a question whether this can be made as a gluten-free cookie. Yes, if you have a preferred gluten-free flour, the only gluten um, ingredient in this would be an all-purpose an all -purpose flour. Uh, tahini is naturally gluten-free um, and all of the other ingredients, I'm just looking around, are also gluten-free. So that's a good question. And somebody asked if we could use plant butter, but I'm not quite sure what, what uh, use plant butter instead of, instead of yeah. the... If you're familiar with the ratios of how to substitute a plant-based butter, like a vegan butter, instead of um, butter, I highly recommend it. Actually, I have a friend, a colleague named Fran Costigan, who's an amazing vegan pastry chef. And I think that she worked to veganize this cookie because there's also an egg in it. So I just, I'll double check if you really want a vegan version, uh, follow up with me. My brand manager um, and her daughters are also vegan. And I task them with veganizing every recipe that's not already vegan in the cookbook. So I'll likely have an answer for you if you're looking for any vegan suggestions. Awesome. Uh, would, would, if you used um, a gluten-free flour, um, would the consistency be similar to the one that's made with a gluten, a glu gluten, gluten-full <laughs> flour? 
filled a glutenous. Um, I'm not gluten free, so I don't cook with gluten free flour. I would imagine that most gluten free flours, like I've seen the brand Cup for Cup that they have refined their recipes that it should be easily substituted to create the same, you know, outcome. But to be honest, I have not, I've not tested it. So I can't say for certain. But I want question. to know if we can all have a taste of your cookies. <laughs> well, you just have to make them at home. They really are so fast. It seems like it's taking longer just because we're chatting while I'm doing it. But I promise it, it goes so, so quickly. A good trick is also, I have some of my granola recipes prepped, um, ingredients prepped here too, but if you just prep everything before you um, assemble it, I couldn't believe when I started cooking this way, you know, for the demos, how quickly it is, how quick it is to cook and how much easier it is to cook. Uh, of course, you know, just prepping and then reading recipes helps, but I'm still learning that even at the expense of my own cookbook. So let me just throw in the other ingredients here, which is going to be one large egg and one teaspoon of vanilla extract. And if any other um, questions came up, I can take that while I blend the egg and the vanilla into the rest of the batter. Um, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the health benefits of tahini. What's, what is it that, why, why, we, why is it better than peanut butter or um, something else that other people would use in this sort of recipe? So um, if there is a vegan, I assume maybe there was because of the plant-based butter question, um, but Tahini is one of the best plant-based sources of protein, calcium, and iron. And so it's, um, it's also rich in vitamins and minerals, and particularly in particular phosphorus and magnesium. So it's one of the most nutritionally dense seeds that truly exists. I mean, what's amazing is that sesame has been cultivated as far as, as, far back as 5,000 BCE, and it was traded and used for ritual and medicinal purposes across many, many cultures. So that nutritional value of tahini, of sesame, has been valued across many cultures, not just, you know, the Middle Eastern culture that tahini is probably most ubiquitous with. Um, and so, you know, um, tahini is just a great substitute if you're looking for more protein um, options that are plant-based. Um, it's also a great substitute, not just for peanut butter, but for other fats, so oils, butter, mayonnaise even. Um, we were chatting before we got started about using it for that. And so um, so not only does it have the nutritional health benefits, but it also has that additional versatility. Like compared to peanut butter, tahini goes great with savory sweets. I mean, smoothies to soups, recipes, right? And peanut butter is a, is a little bit more limited. So now that all those ingredients are combined, let me just throw in a half a teaspoon of uh, baking soda to one and a quarter cups of all purpose flour. It could be maybe a gluten free flour. We'll have to keep testing that and get back to each other. Um, and I'm just going to lightly whisk this. It's very good that my kitchen is so convenient because sometimes I forget to prep all my tools, but I'm going to whisk those things together. And then I'm going to fold this into the wet mixture that I have going on that I already combined the other ingredients with. Spat uh, whisks I learned in testing are not good for combining dry into wet. You might be laughing because you're like, duh, but it just gets stuck in like ooey gooey in there. So definitely do it with a, with a soft wooden spoon or, or something larger. And just fold in a little bit at a time so it gets well incorporated. And now while I keep mixing, I'll show you the batter when I'm done is a good time. If I saw a couple comments maybe pop up if there were more questions. Well, somebody mentioned that Sofra in Cambridge sells your, sells tahini yes. cookies and yeah. uh, the flour measure. So everybody should have received the recipe um, and I'll send it out again when I send you the recording. Um, so whoever wants yeah, that. Sofra. Um, and Oleana and their sister restaurant, Sarma, have been wonderful partners to Zoom um, since we really started distributing in the Boston area. Um, and uh, actually, I don't know if you saw, but so for, so Oleana, right, the like kind of uh, mother restaurant of the whole group, just turned 20 years old. And so, you know, um, Anna Sortoon really is a matriarch of Eastern Mediterranean um, cooking in, in the States. She's really a phenomenal um, entrepreneur, chef, restaurateur. Uh, we've, I've really enjoyed getting to know her and working with her and kind of the food capacity. Um, 
somebody mentioned that they substitute zucchini for mayo with tuna fish. So I don't know if you've ever done that, but that sounds like somebody that something that um, Gila does in Boston, in um, Sharon, Massachusetts. <laughs> she does well, that. That's great. Just plain tahini because we also have a recipe for tangy, um, tang tangy tahini mayo. So you kind of whip the tahini up with some water, some lemon juice, um, and other ingredients to make it a substitute for mayo. And then I like to use that um, into my tuna fish or egg salad. Uh, and chicken salad as well. My little last bit of the flour goes in. Combine that, and then we're going to use a tablespoon, um, a tablespoon to um, scoop out um, exact measures of of the thing of the batter to to make into the cookies. So my oven is set to three hundred and fifty degrees. And the nice thing is that these cookies only have to bake for about 10 minutes. Um, if you like them chewier or softer, maybe start 10, 10 usually is really good. Um, but um, if you like them a little bit more crispy, you can always, of course, increase the, the range, the time range to closer to 11 or 12 minutes. But I found 10 minutes to be my sweet spot. So I'll show you the batter. It's a really simple, just light brown, uh, basic, almost biscuit batter. Very malleable, very soft, really easy to work with. So I'll bring over um, my baking how, tray. How fattening, we wanna know how fattening it is, Amy. How fattening is it, somebody asked. I, so tahini is fattening, let me just say that. It's healthy <laughs> fats, but it's, it's a fatty product. I mean, that's why, um, you can use it as a substitute for butter or oil and things like that. So I'm not gonna lie, right? If you're looking at the nutrition label on tahini, you might be surprised by how much fat is in there. But as we all hopefully know at this point, fat is not bad, right? Fat is good for us, it's good for our skin, it's good for our hair, it's good for our nails. So it's the good kind of fat. Um, so I can't promise that these are low in calorie, but um, they're very delicious and they're not, you know, they're not super indulgent if you don't eat too many of them. So make them, keep them, freeze them. Uh, they're very, very nice to have at home. It's a really nice treat. At some point, I want you to tell us about the other products that you that you sell, that you are involved in. You can see that I'm not like the most aggressive salesperson. I don't even have like my products. <laughs> I want to promote you I love, or anything I love like your that. products. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big supporter. Oh, thank you. No, but you know, what's really been amazing about Zoom Foods is that we've truly built a business. I mean, 80% of our revenue comes from selling this one ingredient tahini. Now, before COVID, 65% of our sales came from selling to distributors and to restaurants all across the country. And 35% of our sales was selling online and in grocery stores, those, you know, few stores really between DC and New York. Maybe we got up to like 400 or so before um, before COVID hit. Now, once COVID hit in March, obviously, unfortunately, our restaurant you know chain was quite devastated. But our direct to consumer, thank you to those people that order our products either on our website or on Amazon, really took off. And so, luckily, having those kind of multiple revenue channels saved us, especially during COVID. So um, now we're working on a hoping that these restaurants come back strong and B, um, you know, continuing to reach people because still so many people are not familiar with what tahini is. But yes, most of our business comes from selling this one product tahini, but we also developed a chocolate sweet tahini spread. We were talking about that for a little bit before everybody hopped on. It's a par, so there's no dairy in it, chocolate spread that's made with only three ingredients tahini, powdered pure cane sugar, and cocoa powder. So it has less than half the amount of sugar of Nutella, and it has no nuts, no dairy, like I said, and also no palm oil in there, something that we're very proud of and committed to. Um, and so that's our chocolate spread. The reason why we decided to create a chocolate spread was because we truly wanted to, you know, communicate to consumers how tahini can be used in sweet, right? So many people only then and still now associate tahini with making hummus or maybe a salad dressing. Um, and one of our favorite ways to use tahini is in baked goods, 
many of our chef partners were using it to make brownies, for instance, early on and still to today. So we actually, Jackie and Omri were traveling in Greece. Um, tahini is also a very popular ingredient in Greece. It's actually the reason why the pronunciation for tahini in the States is tahini as opposed to tahina, right? The Arabic pronunciation. It's because Greek culture and Greek cuisine was so much more popular in the States before Israeli and Middle Eastern cuisine took off. And they brought tahini over and that's how they pronounce it, tahini. So they saw a chocolate tahini spread and we decided to start experimenting with our tahini to make a chocolate spread as well. So that's our other ingredient that we sell. Our, our other product is a chocolate sweet tahini. It's absolutely delicious. It kind of tastes like frosting. Actually spreading a little bit of chocolate zoom on top of these cookies is absolutely perfect. <laughs> um, and then we also sell a date syrup or silan, which is a popular sweetener in Israel and across many regions of the Middle East that's made from just 100% steamed and pressed dates. So um, that is a great complement to tahini in, in Israel and also in Iraq. Tahini and Ceylon are kind of like the peanut butter and jelly of the you know, United States. Um, we would like to know, did you grease the pan? I did not. Okay, and um, question whether the tahini should be refrigerated once you've opened it. So tahini, I'm just going to stick these in. Good question. Good question, Amy. For 10 minutes. Okay, everybody time 10 minutes. Alexa, set, I'm just kidding, I don't have a little Alexa. We're, but we're, we're on it, we got it. I set a timer too. Um, <laughs> tahini does not need to be refrigerated even once open. Uh, oh, sesame good. oil is actually a natural preservative. So it's na it naturally preserves the, the rest of the product. But there are some benefits to refrigerating your tahini. Now, I don't refrigerate my tahini. I keep it in the pantry. In the pantry, the oil is more likely to separate a little bit faster. When it's at a colder temperature, the refrigerate kind of suspends the oil, right, and keeps it from separating so much. But it's also not as pourable, which in my opinion is the best thing about tahini is just like drizzling it or pouring it into whatever you're cooking with if you're not measuring with it. Um, and so um, you do not have to keep tahini in the fridge. What turns tahini rancid is water. So that's why once you make a tahini sauce or once you make hummus, that's what can go bad. But if you're always using a clean spoon or just pouring from the jar, uh, tahini will not go bad just from air or just from sitting around. Great, thank you. Yes, great question. It's a hot topic in the office, who refrigerates their tahini and who mm. keeps it in the pantry. Got any tahini jokes? <laughs> no, we have a lot of Zoom puns. Um, actually, one of my favorite things, we were joking, you know, at the beginning, well, maybe you weren't joking, but like Zoom, Zoom. Uh, we actually had a customer reach out to us very early into the pandemic. It was maybe the end of March saying, I was Googling Zoom, but came up with Zoom. And your products look so nice that I ended up buying them anyway. <laughs> so that was one of, I think, our biggest successes. Also, since our maiden names, right, our Z, Zeitelman, um, a lot of people, especially friends and family from when we grew up, call the company Zoom anyway. So we are now uh, greatly regretting not getting a copyright on Zoom because I think we uh, we missed the boat on, uh, on getting the rights to that word. But um no, we use Zoom puns like Zoom, um, and a lot of our phones now autocorrect from Soon, S-O-O-N, to Zoom. So that makes us really happy when that happens. Um, but no, not many tahini puns. Although, and now I'm rambling, our father just texted us. Um, maybe, Hillary, you saw this in the Washington Post that there was recently a cartoon that made a joke about tahini i think it was something about tahini being in like it was like a dog joke like in a bum or something like in a butt um and our father was very proud he said that the Sum sisters you know really brought tahini to the mainstream to get it into a washington post cartoon so that was very exciting for us i'm i'm curious here you are you know three sisters um with a family business how, 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 how's that is challenges, um, benefits? Um, I don't know if you want to share with us anything that is, uh, that you've enjoyed about being in business with your sisters. No, I'm an open book. I mean, a, my favorite thing about being in business with my sisters is just the fact that it, 
it really connects us, right? I mean, especially now that I've gotten well older, we've all gotten a little bit older, right? All in our thirties, all have kids. If we weren't connected through our professions, I think it would be even harder for us to connect, you know, to, to find the time um, to uh, sit down and have a conversation, right? This kind of forces us to talk like almost every single day to check in about something small about the business or of course, you know, holds more um, serious, you know, monthly meetings between the three of us since we make up the, the board of the organization. But I'm four years younger than my oldest sister, Shelby. So for instance, you know, when I got into high school, she was just in getting into college. And when I was in college, she was starting her career. And so we were never super close. And luckily we started this business right as I was graduating college. Um, and so that brought us, you know, really close. And so that's been a huge gift of working with my sisters. Um, we definitely blur the lines, right? Sometimes we're at a family function and we talk uh, about Zoom or sometimes we're having a board meeting and we start talking about our kids. Um, but and, and sometimes, right, the family brings up Zoom and we say that we just don't want to talk about business tonight, uh, which is also a boundary that our family, you know, respects and has, um, you know, supported us in creating. Um, I would say probably the biggest challenge is that, um, our personal lives are so intertwined. So God forbid something goes wrong, right? If somebody's sick or somebody or a, a nephew, if my sister's kid has a problem, you know, we're all so invested in that, that it could probably, you know, it could, luckily we haven't had a significant death or anything like that, but that could be, you know, a really, you know, I think challenge for us um, as sisters and as business owners. Um, but overall, it's just been, it's been really fun. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's something that while well, we hope to have this business for many, many years that we're going to look back on fondly and be very proud that we accomplished yeah. together. So Amazing. it's been a real blessing. We've loved it. Fantastic. All right. So you've got three minutes left on your, uh, four minutes left on your 10 minute timer. Oh, perfect. So let me, um, let's also check time. We have about 20 minutes left together. Let's start getting the granola together. The granola, I'm going to need to bring my temp, my oven down because the secret to this granola is to only set the oven to 250. We're going to let this cook slow and low, and uh, it really kind of makes this like large chunk, really flavorful granola. Um, so it won't be done, you know, before we get together. Um, but and I also need to bring my oven down, but let's just um, incorporate the granola. So this is a very easy recipe as well. We have two cups of old fashioned oats. Is this the right one? I think I want to do it in this actually larger one. We, we are assuming that it's all delicious. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that's an old one. All delicious. And I truly hope that you um, feel comfortable and encouraged to make it at home um, because all of these recipes I really made with cooks like me in mind, right? Like I'm not a professional chef. I'm busy. I've got a two and a half year old. I run a business, right? I really wanted to create recipes that a you could follow along easily, and but then also feel empowered to not have to follow the recipe the next time, right? If you make it once or twice and you kind of get a groove for what it should feel and taste like, go ahead and like kind of go off script a little bit. Um, but I'm following the script, so let's let's keep at it. Um, we're also doing half a cup of a combination, well, half a cup of sliced almonds half a cup of sesame seeds, good old fashioned sesame seeds, and also half a cup of chopped walnuts. Um, so delicious. We combine all that together and just give this a little toss. And then in a side bowl, this is where we're going to combine our wet ingredients, um, which is Oh no, I also want to combine in the dries just a little bit of cinnamon. It's about, it's a half a, a teaspoon. And we'll mix that up in there. And then my last um, dry ingredient, I, this is why I always need to read the recipe thoroughly, um, is a pinch of salt. So like I was saying, I just keep that little, um, now it's out of frame, but that little bowl right in my kitchen. And I just grab a pinch, it doesn't have to add up to much. much. If you like things salty, feel free to add a little more, make it even more salty and sweet. And then I'm gonna combine my wet ingredients. So this is six tablespoons of pure maple syrup. A lot of people here ask me whether they can use our Ceylon, for instance, as a substitute. 
I actually strongly suggest not to. Um, Ceylon has a lower glycemic index. The date syrup has a lower glycemic index. It also has a different consistency than maple syrup. And so while, yes, you can absolutely make a granola with date syrup, um, I just cannot recommend enough the, the flavor of maple here. It's absolutely phenomenal. And I'd assume that you guys have pretty good maple syrup up by you since you're closer to, say, like Vermont and things like that. Is that a fair assumption? I have no idea. I'm sure you can get good grade maple syrup everywhere in America. Everywhere. <laughs> We're also going to do a quarter cup of tahini. Um, maple and tahini is also one of my favorite combos. This makes a delicious syrup substitute if you're making waffles or pancakes. We have a couple recipes for waffles and pancakes with um, syrups like this, tahini and maple syrup combo. So highly recommend these together. Have you put your chocolate one in there before? Have you tried it with the chocolate tahini? I haven't, but a friend has, and it's absolutely delicious. We do have some recipes for chocolate cookies as well on the website. Um, and so that's a, some, there's actually one, it's a double chocolate chunk cookie. It's chocolate soom with a bunch of chocolate chips in it. And it's phenomenal. That's a great cookie. So there are lots of ways to use chocolate in baking too. But remember the chocolate already has sugar in it. So you might want to substitute out some of the maple syrup or kind of like readjust that wet, wet to dry ratio. I'm not an expert, so I'm not sure hundred percent, but we could definitely play around and find that out as well. Um, and then we have two tablespoons of coconut. It, oh, it's um, it's uh, 10 minutes, Amy, just want to give it's you the, the, the heads up. I've got 10 minutes on my clock. My timer just went off also. So let me check it. I just put in two tablespoons of coconut oil. I kept kind of nuking this to keep it away from room temperature because as you might know, coconut oil goes solid at room temperature. Um, so let me check these. So I just want to let you know, I don't know, Jane um, says that her son has a sugar shack in Vermont. And if you're interested in phenomenal maple syrup that she will share the information with us. So yeah. good to go, Jane, just share it with us. <laughs> we all want it. Are interested in phenomenal maple syrup. I guess that's the advantage. I don't know where Jane, Jane, where are you? Are you local? Where, where do you live? Hi, you and I spoke on the phone earlier tonight. Oh, great. I'm, I'm in Providence, Providence on the east okay. side. Yeah. Good, yeah. excellent. So share your uh, son's information with us. I Please. will, definitely. Awesome, thank you. Nothing's better than good maple syrup. But I just want to show you that when I touch these, these have a little give to them. I like my cookies a little bit more chewy on the inside. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna let this temper for a couple minutes while I finish combining the, um, the granola. And then I'm gonna transfer the cookies onto a wire wrap on top of a, you know, just to let them dry more completely. So I just put a wire wrap, any type of wrap that you have over another baking pan. Um, it's not rocket science, but as you can see, I'm not a very sophisticated baker, so it's a big deal for me, but there we go. Um, perfect, so we're just gonna combine uh, the tahini, the maple syrup, and a little bit of that coconut oil into our wet mixture. And we're gonna pour that over the, we're gonna pour that over the dry mixture, and then we're gonna fold in some raisins or whatever is your favorite dried fruit. Um, I also love in this a little bit of, um, you know, sour dried cherries are great, um, but maple for me, oats and um, raisins are just the perfect combination. Our mom made us um, oatmeal a lot growing up and we, you know, have it with some maple syrup and raisins and, and that's my, one of my favorite flavor combos there. The, so the good news is your mother's on the, on the show. Oh, <laughs> She told me she wasn't sure if she was going to be on. So, you know, she's so busy these days. But hey, mom. Um, and this is just a really great granola to keep at home. You can keep this stored in a Tupperware for up to three weeks, really. It's one of my favorite snacks um, after dinner and before bed. I love to eat granola with milk, like kind of my cereal. Um, and so that's one of my favorite ways to do it. So just toss this together until it feels like most of the oats are, or hopefully all the oats are pretty well coated. And then we'll do that again. And as we pour in half a cup of your dried fruit, like I said, today I have raisins. 
I also keep tons of raisins in my house because my son Henry loves them. So um, whatever you have available, just use it. Um, I try to encourage people not to go out and buy anything new if you don't have to for a recipe. See, I have a little bit of wet here, so I'm gonna make the most of it. Again, I don't know if you can see, but it's why I love having a silicone spatula. It's like, I don't even need to clean the bowl anymore. Just kidding. Oh, but I did just um, remember that I'm just gonna open my oven for a sec and I'm gonna take it down to 250. I'm gonna let it cool off while it kind of resets. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna spread this granola over another baking pan. I also don't grease that baking pan. And um, we're gonna spread it out. We're gonna cook it at the 250, I believe for 40 minutes. Okay, Amy, quick question about the, uh, the coconut oil. Um, did you, you say you melt it first or you just bring it to room temperature or like how, what do you do with the coconut oil so it's not so hard? So I scoop the coconut oil at room temperature, the two tablespoons worth, give or take, of course. And then I melt that down in my, um, in 15 second increments. It usually takes no time at all. I melt that down into my microwave before incorporating into the recipe. But if you prefer another type of nut oil, um, it's mostly just for that nice nutty flavor to complement the tahini. Um, you could always, of course, use olive oil if that's what you have, but um, the coconut oil, it's, it's very easy to use. It's very versatile, actually. If you've never bought some, maybe that's something that you can buy because it's really fun to cook and bake with um, and very easy to, to have. I'll spread this out on my pan and then show you guys what it looks like before it Actually, before I do that, let's put my cookies onto the rim. Perfect. So these come off just like little small biscuits. They're absolutely delicious. And these will just let cool while we finish racking or plating the, um, spreading the granola. And then we can dig into these. If you are making the entire batter at a time, you can of course put more than one baking sheet into the oven. Just set two of your wire racks, set two of your racks near the middle of the oven and halfway through baking it, swap the racks. Um, it's really simple to do. And then if you have more batter and need to do another bath, just let that uh, baking sheet come back to room temperature. You don't want to put the cookies on while the baking sheet is hot in order to do a final batch. This actually yields close to like 36, um, probably like three batches of, of cookies. So um, you might have to do that more than once. Um, when you put the granola onto the, uh, the pan without greasing it, um, so that little bit of coconut oil does the trick then. Yeah, exactly. Tahini also remember has oil in it as well. So that is why you don't need to use a lot of coating oil uh, when you're baking with it. And parchment paper, do you ever use parchment paper, pa, 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 parchment paper on the baking sheet? Yes, um, I don't have any at the moment in my home, <laughs> but uh, it's a great tool for easier cleanup. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Our picture in the cookbook actually has parchment paper in it. So I, um, I remember that when we were cooking this for the photo shoot, we, we baked it on parchment paper. The, the recipe also says that halfway through the 40 minutes, you can toss the granola in the oven and then re-pat it down. If you want thicker, you know, like bigger, chunkier pieces, you do not have to mix it up in the middle. It actually will bake all the way through. Or if you do want it to be kind of more evenly cooked, just make sure that when you pat it back down in the middle again, um, it's pretty close because I like my granola, like kind of with bigger chunks, but I also don't mind when it has smaller pieces, of course. It's just a preference and you can always play around with it because I think you'll find, especially if you have more than a couple people in your home, that when you make this, um, it will go quickly and then you can make it again. So that's it. That's all I do is I just lightly pat the granola 
onto the baking pan. Looks like a kind of cake at that point. Looks like my oven came back down to 250 and I'll set it for 40 minutes. These are pretty cool. You'll see they have really nice creases on them. It makes it great for, of course, uh, putting on some chocolate soum or another flavor that you might like on top. We also like to put uh, vanilla, vanilla ice cream in the middle on the flat side and you can make uh, ice cream sandwiches with them. <laughs> Whoever mm -hmm. asked the question about it being fattening and put, put the ice cream in there. <laughs> um, it is what it is. No. Since um, starting a food business, I've not, I've been less concerned about the, um, I shouldn't say that. I, I care about the nutritional value of food, but when I have a food that might not be so nutritious, I just eat a little bit of it because it's so worth it to have just delicious things all the time. <laughs> um, and these are, I actually haven't made these for quite a few weeks, are just so delicious. They're really chewy on the inside. The outside stays crunchy, um, which I love. And they just have a really simple, I know simple doesn't sound so exciting, but I love it. Just a simple biscuit, buttery, tahini, nutty -y flavor. So um, I just really enjoy having these at home. Well, we're excited. We're excited to try it ourselves. Maybe everybody, when you make yours, take a picture and send it to us and we'll, we'll post a a little um, after party, what, uh, oh, what we created. Yeah. Is Core Rhode Island on um, social media? Say it again, please. Are, are, is Core on social media? So we have, this is Core Connects Rhode Island. We have a Facebook page. Yeah, perfect. That's, that's what we have. <laughs> perfect. Then we can post them on the Facebook page. Absolutely. Absolutely. Bring them with you to the challah bake on February the 11th. <laughs> And the Tubish Vat Seda, I don't know, can we use them for the Tubish Vat Seda? Maybe we'll get your date syrup for the Tubish Vat Seda we're having. Um, at the Nola could probably be nice um, with the raisins in it. Maybe you could put additional dried fruit in it for a Tubish Vat. Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, it is plant-based, so Tubish Vat, we eat lots of veggies mm -hmm. and plants. Yep. I've got plenty of recipes in the tahini table to celebrate Tubish Vat. Right, so tell us about some of the recipes, Amy, like like cookies and brownies and, and salad dressing. How else can we use your tahini? Like what else What else is a, is a favorite or what else is a very popular recipe for using tahini? So we have five chapters in the cookbook. It starts with sauces because having a couple of tahini sauces available um, is an easy way to throw together dinner, whether you're cooking proteins or just roasting veggies. Those sauces also get incorporated into additional recipes throughout the books. Um, and so there are sauces, there are dips, of course, like hummus and uh, some more sophisticated dips like I, I made recently with some friends over Zoom, our spinach tahini and feta dip. It's kind of, um, if you were to add in chopped artichokes, it's a really, really nice um, bright green dish to have on the table. Uh, one of my favorite recipes, actually, mom, you're still on the call, um, is uh, called mom's chicken. Uh, it's a recipe that my mom and I developed back when Soom was still a baby and my mom was constantly challenging us, you know, how else can I use tahini? How else can I use tahini? And we came across a recipe in the New York Times that was a turmeric chicken, but it used uh, Greek yogurt. And since we keep kosher at home, um, we didn't want to use Greek yogurt. So I made a quick tahini sauce, tahini with water, lemon and garlic. We mix in some turmeric and we use that as the marinade for the chicken. And it created this really great crispy skin um, we ended up combining that with um, baked chickpeas and some cooked onions um, for the cookbook, and it's a delicious dish to have. Um, another one of my favorites is our tahini butternut squash. It, we create a citrus tahini sauce. So traditionally, tahini is most commonly paired with lemon as the citrus complement, but we use a lot of orange throughout um, the book because I love that sweet, sweeter kind of flavor profile. It makes a more a more subtle sauce. And so this is a very simple roasted butternut squash with all you're doing is combining tahini with some lemon juice and orange juice, a pinch of crushed red pepper. And then you're very quickly um, create searing on the, on the stove um, some walnuts with za'atar and some parsley. And it's just absolutely phenomenal. It's a great dish to have. Actually, maybe that's good for two spot. So You'll find everything from the sauces, the dips, even breakfast, smoothies, 
um, to desserts like uh, parv ice creams and also uh, the carrot cake. Uh, that's a very um, special story to me and my sisters in the, the start of Zoom. So lots of recipes that are near and dear to my heart, um, other members of the Zoom crew and our family, um, and everything from breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and meals in between. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I don't know if you've actually already answered this question, but somebody's asking for a very quick, easy salad dressing to do for tonight's dinner. Quick, quick, uh, like on the tip of your tongue, like Equal maybe parts, olive oil, lemon juice, honey, um, and, um, and a tablespoon of, of tahini. So you can just do like two tablespoons of olive oil, two tablespoons of lemon juice, um, a tablespoon of honey, or if you have Ceylon, that's delicious too, and a tablespoon of tahini, and it whisks up into a really easy vinaigrette. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Amy, you're amazing. Thank you so, 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 so much. Um, everybody yeah. now is a great fan of yours and um, I'm sure we'll be uh, getting more of your product and enjoying it and, and trying to create more recipes for ourselves. Um, I want everybody to know that, um, that Amy um, didn't didn't uh, didn't want to be uh, remunerated for this session tonight. So um, therefore, we were able to offer this for no charge. Everybody got to come for free and enjoy. And uh, so, thank you, Amy, for uh, your services and for and for spreading community and unity and connecting us to Israel, to you and your family, um, to delicious Israeli healthy food. And um, everybody's invited to all our Core Connects Rhode Island events. We have book groups, we have a Tubish Vat Seder coming up, we have a challah bake, all virtual, everything's virtual. So if you're in Boston or North Carolina or Maryland or wherever you are, you're invited to come and join us. Um, please do um, at book groups, et cetera, et cetera, lots of programs. And actually we have a new one coming up. I haven't advertised yet, but we have four really fantastic, amazing local Rhode Island Jewish healthcare workers on the front line who are going to be doing a panel discussion conversation about their experiences in the front lines um so that's coming up in february so lots of love to everybody you should have a wonderful time please send us pictures of your cookies of your granola of anything everything stay connected have a beautiful night happy new year thank you and so I'm much gonna end the call now good night everybody Bye. thank you everyone